Welcome everyone to the program year 2021 Community Development Program application webinar. I am Deanna Gibbs. I will be hosting this training today for everyone. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. We want everyone to please type your questions in the Q&A panel so we can keep a running list and post them on the TA site along with the answers. And we want to reserve the chat box for any technical difficulties. So if you can't hear or you can't see the presentation, please drop a message in the chat box to either me as the host or to any of the participants, I'm sorry, not the participants, any of our panelists, and we'll try to work through those technical issues. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thanks, Deanna. I'm Mary Oakley, Community Investments Manager, and welcome to the PY 2021 Community Development Program Application Training. This webinar is being recorded the recording will be made available on OCD's technical assistance website. As Deanna mentioned, we will take questions at the end and also post the Q&A to our training and technical site assistance site as soon as it's available. This training will review program staffing and our CDBG budget and program timelines. I will summarize the design of the allocation, neighborhood revitalization, and critical infrastructure programs and highlight changes for 2021. I will also review changes to both the OCEAN and application documents, reference applicable policy notices, and provide tips for a successful application. I'm happy to welcome two new members to our team this year. In addition to continuing to work with Ben, Jared, Tiffany, and Wes, I will encourage communities and territories A, and E to reach out to their new program reps. Tom and Grant both started with the office this month. Tom previously worked for an Ohio City that received CDBG funding through an entitlement county, and Grant comes from an entitlement county in Virginia. Allocation is administered as a biennial program. With 51 of the 101 eligible communities receiving funds in 2021 and the other 50 receiving funds in 2022, communities are eligible to apply for neighborhood revitalization in the year they receive allocation. Both 20 and 21 grantees are eligible to apply for critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is administered in rounds and there will be multiple opportunities to apply if funds are available. Also, as a reminder, the downtown program is no longer administered under the community development umbrella. It's an open cycle program and staff can provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. The president signed the HUD budget on December 27, 2020. HUD released the CDBG budget on February 25, 2021. CDBG received a 1.5% increase, but Ohio's allocation decreased about $100,000 due to changes in data used to run the formula. OCD posted the 2021 allocations to the technical assistance site on March 9th. Ohio will allocate its CDBG budget in accordance with the same percentages as in past years. 50% of the community development, 50% of the funds will be allocated to community development programs, 25% for the residential infrastructure and economic development programs, 20% for the community housing impact and preservation program, 2% for targets of opportunity, 2% for administration, and 1% for T and TA. The anticipated timeline for this year's program is as follows. Allocations were posted March 9th. Mary, I think your slides are not advancing. I just saw the note in the chat box and they are for me, so let me take a, a pause and let's see if we can figure this out. I 
I think I might need the presenter ball. Can you see the slides advancing, advancing now? Yes, it looks like we're on slide 10. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. So picking up on slide 10, allocations were posted March 9th. Communities that have neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure grants that have been completed and all of the funds have been drawn can request OCD to monitor and close the grant. This will increase the number of new applications a community can submit. This request needs to be made to us in writing. Email is fine by April 30th. That's a week from this Friday. The application attachments will be available on or about May 3rd. We will open the application in Ocean on or about May 15th. The deadline for submission is June 16th at 11.59 p.m. That is a Wednesday again this year. We anticipate making award announcements for neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure in mid-August. Grant agreements will be dated September 1st and issued as close to that date as possible. Unfunded critical infrastructure applications will either be rejected or returned for second round resubmission. Awards made September 1 of 2021 will have an August 31st, 2023 work completion deadline, a September 30th, 2023 request for payment deadline, and an October 31st, 2023 final performance report deadline. As a reminder, allocation and neighborhood revitalization awards share a grant agreement. Critical infrastructure is a standalone grant agreement, even if allocation funds are included as leverage. The number of open grants impacts eligibility for new awards. Counties can apply for a maximum of two neighborhood revitalization grants and have no more than two grants open at a time. Cities may apply for a maximum of one neighborhood revitalization grant and have no more than one grant open at a time. This year, there is a new pre-application requirement for the neighborhood revitalization program. This is important. We don't want anyone to miss the application window because they are not aware of the pre-application requirement. The pre-application was posted to OCD's technical assistance site yesterday. Communities are allowed to submit the pre-application between May 10th and June 4th. If it is accepted, communities will be notified by June 9th and can enter the application in OCEAN. It's to your advantage to submit the pre-application as early in that window as possible. The pre-application includes the following items. A description of the target area and selection rationale. The low and moderate income percent of the target area and whether it's qualified using American Community Survey data or an income survey. A list of the proposed activities. A brief description of the community outreach process. And the sources and uses budget. Please note there is a new 5% leverage requirement this year. That is 5% of the CDBG request. Communities are strongly encouraged to use revolving loan fund or allocation for leverage. Projects with additional funding score better, not just because of leverage, but also because they allow for completion of a more comprehensive project. The number of open grants also impacts eligibility for new critical infrastructure awards. Counties can apply for a maximum of three critical infrastructure grants and have no more than three grants open at a time. Cities may apply for a maximum of two grants and have no more than three grants open at a time. A project cannot be included in multiple neighborhood revite or critical infrastructure applications. And funds from one neighborhood re revitalization or critical infrastructure program cannot be used as leverage for another. Also, allocation, neighborhood revitalization, and critical infrastructure funds from a prior grant year cannot be used as leverage for a community's 2021 application. The pre-application continues to be a requirement for the critical infrastructure program. It was also posted to OCD's technical assistance site yesterday. 
Communities are allowed to submit the pre-application between May 10th and June 4th. We will make a correction on that slide. It's June 4th, not June 1st. If it's accepted, communities will be notified by June 9th and OCD staff will open the application in OCEAN. Again, I would recommend submitting the pre-application as soon as possible. This allows us to have some back and forth with you if we have questions. The pre-application requires a project summary, a designation of the infrastructure status, the sources and uses budget, including a leverage commitment of at least 10% of the CDBG request. Again, allocation and the revolving loan fund are recommended sources. The national objective under which a project will be qualified and an acknowledgement the project is ready to proceed. Projects can be qualified as low and moderate income area benefit, limited clientele, or slum and blight. Area slum and blight can be used for central business district infrastructure projects that benefit a residential population or a public facility in a blighted area. Spot slum and blight is limited to buildings and activities that alleviate public health and safety concerns. Projects that require a permit to install or EPA plan approval must provide evidence of this at the time of application. In 2020, we begin requiring forms to show the applicant's current revolving loan fund balance, outstanding obligations and future commitments. We will continue to reduce grant awards for communities that have uncommitted revolving loan fund balances. Pressure from high to spend local program income and the limited availability of state grant funds means local governments must substantially disperse revolving loan fund dollars with or prior to submission of community development program applications. Two forms are required. The first is a program income Excel form that summarizes the current and future obligations to loans or other CDBG programs. The second is an implementation plan that details loans, waivers, and other CDBG programs identified on the first program income form. If you've applied for CHIP funding, it's the same concept in showing revolving loan fund dollars that are currently committed versus available to be spent. We have a lot of new grantees in communities that need a refresher. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on the basic design of the allocation, neighborhood revitalization, and critical infrastructure programs. Although 101 communities are provided with a biennial allocation, funding is not guaranteed. There was a lot of discussion prior to development's decision to administer another allocation cycle. And a lot of that discussion centered on how to make the program better. Communities cannot continue to submit ineligible projects or projects that do not meet a national objective when agency staff is available to provide technical assistance. Please vet your projects with us prior to application submission. If a community does not have projects with costs that add up to the allocation, the community may apply for less than the designated amount. If an application is submitted with an ineligible activity, the application has deficiencies that cannot be resolved or are not corrected within 30 days of OCD's initial review, or the application does not include replacement projects for unsuccessful neighborhood revitalization or critical infrastructure applications, OCD can reduce the amount of the grant. Unawarded allocation funds are used for neighborhood revitalizations and critical infrastructure projects. Also, leverage is a requirement for the neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure programs. There should not be any community unable to apply because it cannot meet the leverage requirement. The allocation and revolving loan fund are available resources. We have had a lot of questions about the citizen participation process this year, which I understand with the expedited measures provided with CARES Act funding. For 2021, we're back to the normal standard, two public hearings, one general and one specific, each with a minimum 10 day notification period. We still allow the alternative method of posting the notices and the hearings can be virtual. 
Policy Notice 0701 outlines the requirements. The Neighborhood Revitalization Program requires a much more robust community participation process, which we will, will review later. For the Community Development Program, we're also still requiring the Community Development Implementation Strategy, or CDIS, to assist communities in notifying stakeholders about funding opportunities and soliciting projects. Communities may submit three, four, or five projects depending on the amount of their allocation. Please note that this is a reduction from past years. Each funding level was reduced by one project. Reducing the number of available projects to increase impact was a grantee suggestion during one of our advisory committee meetings. Communities are still allowed one additional project for every successful neighborhood revitalization or critical infrastructure application. Also, projects can have multiple activities. For example, a street reconstruction project can include water, street, and sidewalk activities. Activities must have the same national objective and the same beneficiaries to be considered one project. Eligible activities are outlined in Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. There are a few exceptions. We do not allow maintenance activities, street resurfacing or paving, housing activities other than home repair, revolving loan fund capitalization, economic development activities, and activities that qualify under the urgent need national objective. The prohibition on street resurfacing or paving is new for 2021. Communities may use the funds to undertake street rehabilitation or reconstruction projects. We have developed a guidance document to assist communities in understanding what type of work qualifies. This document will be posted to our technical assistance site soon. Street resurfacing projects are defined as the installation of new asphalt over an existing layer of road, whereas street rehabilitation and full depth reconstruction remove layers of pavement and then replace both sublayers and the surface layer. Replacement of pavement layers at a depth below the surface increases the useful life of the improvement. We still allow communities to do road resurfacing or paving as a component of a comprehensive neighborhood revitalization project. Allocation requires at least 51% of the funds exclusive of administration and fair housing to be used for low and moderate income benefit projects. Therefore, slum and blight projects are capped at 49% of the grant. Public services are capped at 15% and planning is capped at $20,000. All three caps can be waived with submission of a waiver request form at the time of application. OCD encourages communities to request waivers for good projects. The need for planning was discussed extensively at our stakeholder outreach meetings, and I would expect to see planning projects submitted for this year's funding. The next two slides depict a list of eligible public services, including but not limited to education, recreation, services for victims of domestic violence, legal services, fair housing, home buyer education, transportation, energy conservation, counseling and testing, health care, child care, public safety, services for seniors, job training, services for homeless persons, and drug abuse counseling and treatment. Eligible public service costs include labor, defined as salary and benefits for staff and contract employees to carry out an eligible public service, the purchase or lease of equipment or materials to carry out an eligible public service, and operations or maintenance of a facility in which an eligible public service is housed. Public services can either be performed directly by the local government 
or contracted via subrecipient agreement by a community action agency, public health provider, or a nonprofit entity. These agreements must be developed in accordance with 24 CFR 570.503 and 2 CFR 200.331. Subrecipients must be solicited through a request for application process, provide a firm commitment prior to application submission, and may use up to 20% of the project award for activity delivery costs, including carrying out application activities and income qualifying beneficiaries. Those of you who have submitted public service requests through the CARES Act program, are starting to get familiar with this process. Planning activities must be CDBG eligible and meet the low and moderate income or slum and blight national objectives. Projects must identify the community's low and moderate income or slum and blight needs. Planning dollars must produce a tangible project for submission to OCD further the state's investment objectives, and be used to further develop and design future applications to meet local community and economic development needs. Fair housing is also a required component of the allocation program. Administration and fair housing combined cannot exceed 20% of the grant. Activities can be funded solely with leverage, Grant funds do not have to be requested for fair housing, but every application must include a standard fair housing program. The performance timeframe for fair housing varies slightly from the other grant projects. Fair housing runs from January 1, 2022 to December 31st, 2023, rather than September 1st of 2021 through October 31st of 2023. Fair housing activities must include both a training component and an outreach component and identify quantifiable, measurable services and beneficiaries. The fair housing forms were updated a few years ago to be more clear about training and outreach requirements. Also, communities must notify OCD if they need to change their fair housing programs after the grant is awarded. Sheila Bradshaw is OCD's fair housing specialist and she can be reached for questions. Moving on to the neighborhood revitalization program, the maximum award continues to be $750,000. There is a three activity minimum, excluding administration. The program funds infrastructure and public facilities in a clearly identified low and moderate income target area. And demolition is capped at $175,000 or 25% of the project budget. Administration is capped at the lesser of $50,000 or 15% 50, of the grant request. Related engineering, architectural, and legal service costs may be charged to the activity budget. And professional fees may be entered as a separate activity within a project budget. And we will show a screenshot with an example of that a little bit later on. There are new eligibility thresholds this year. Applications must include a 5% minimum leverage commitment. Leverage is calculated as a percent of the CDBG request. It can come from public and private sources. Again, allocation and revolving loans and commitments are encouraged and more investment results in a more comprehensive project. We have also made community participation a threshold in addition to a scoring component this year. 
To meet the threshold, a community must first demonstrate it has informed residents about eligible activities, surveyed residents about their needs, selected activities for the grant application in accordance with the survey results, provided a rationale for discrepancies between the surveys and selected activities, and ensured selected activities aligned with the neighborhood facilities inventory condition scores. Applications are scored in accordance with these five categories. Program design is worth 45 points and includes the comprehensiveness of the proposal, whether it addresses the needs of the target area, consistency with the application's neighborhood facilities inventory and other planning documents, and the extent to which the program results in an improved living environment. Distress is worth 15 points and calculated based on the percent and the number of low and moderate income persons in the target area. Leverage is worth five points and calculated based on the amount of other committed resources and the extent to which the community will coordinate efforts and implement complementary programs during the grant period. Administration and implementation capacity is worth 15 points and includes the applicant communities and identified administrators' capacity to carry out federal, state, and programmatic requirements, experience in OCD administration of programs, the applicant community's historical performance, and the progress of other projects currently funded with OCD administered funds. This category also includes points for the accuracy and quality of application materials. Finally, community participation is worth 20 points, and it includes the extent to which the local citizens and community organizations support selection of the proposed activities, and the community's effectiveness in involving local citizens in program planning. The planning process should include details regarding information dissemination, project selection, and prioritization strategies. Critical infrastructure is up next. The maximum award is $500,000. This program is administered as open cycle, but applications are accepted in multiple rounds, depending on the availability of funding throughout the year. And the program is designed to fund high priority single purpose public infrastructure and public facility projects. Projects can be qualified under the national objectives of low and moderate income benefit, limited clientele, or slum and blight. Area slum and blight can be used for central business district infrastructure that benefits a residential population, or a public facility in a blighted area. Spot slum and blight is limited to buildings and activities that alleviate public health and safety concerns. Like the residential public infrastructure program, critical infrastructure can also fund water and sanitary sewer projects. Because we have a larger budget for the residential public infrastructure program, we ask that communities first try to qualify water and sewer projects under that program if the total project cost is greater than $600,000. Please consult with us prior to submitting a water or sewer project, and we will guide you as to the most appropriate funding source. Also, and this pertains to implementation after the grants are awarded, critical infrastructure funds must be prorated. This means that the percent of critical infrastructure approved at the time of grant agreement cannot increase if there is a cost savings. The exceptions are revolving loan fund and allocation. Those programs may be expended in their entirety. Administration is capped at the lesser of $30,000 or 10% of the grant request. Related engineering, architectural, and legal service costs may be charged to the activity budget. Professional fees may be entered as a separate activity within a project budget. And again, we'll show an example. 
This program also comes with eligibility thresholds. There is a 10% minimum leverage requirement. It is also calculated as a percent of the CDBG request. Both public and private sources can be used. And allocation and revolving loan fund commitments are encouraged. The infrastructure or facility must be in critical or poor condition. And the applicant must document how the failed or failing infrastructure impacts service area residents. Projects also must be ready to proceed. This means a permit to install or plan approval has been received and is submitted with the application, or if not applicable, design has been completed and there are no barriers to construction start. Applications are scored according to the following parameters. The stress is worth 10 points and calculated based on the LMI percent of the service area and the LMI percent of the community responsible for maintaining the infrastructure. App uh, administration and implementation capacity is worth 15 points and calculated based on the applicant communities and identified administrators capacity to carry out federal, state, and programmatic requirements, experience in administering OCD funded programs, the applicant community's historical performance and progress of other projects currently funded with OCD administered funds. And this category also includes points for the accuracy and the quality of application materials. Program design is worth 75 points and includes the project's criticality as demonstrated by the application narrative, photographs, the critical infrastructure condition form, and additional supporting documentation. Points are awarded based on the impact of the infrastructure's current condition on identified beneficiaries, the number of individuals expected to benefit from the project and supporting documentation. Also factored in are useful life, the appropriateness of the project to meet the critical need identified, and inclusion of resilience or mitigation measures for sustainability. Prioritization of projects through a grantee's planning efforts are also considered. It's really as easy as this. From a technical perspective, tell us how the infrastructure has failed or is failing and provide third-party supporting documentation to back your narrative. And from a human perspective, tell us how the residents are impacted and provide third-party supporting documentation to show us. You also will need to make a clear connection between the identified problem and the proposed solution. Since there are a few significant changes this year, I do want to take a few minutes to recap them. Allocation is not guaranteed. Funds may be lost if applications are submitted with ineligible activities, deficiencies that cannot be corrected within 30 days, and backup projects are not provided. Street resurfacing or repaving and repair are not eligible. Communities may complete street rehabilitation and reconstruction projects, with the exception for neighborhood revitalization, and a minimum leverage commitment of 5% is now required for the neighborhood revitalization program in addition to a community participation process threshold. Free applications are required for both the neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure program. Subrecipient agreements are permitted for public services. Communities are encouraged to use allocation funds for planning activities and request a waiver to exceed the $20,000 cap. And there is a reduction in the number of projects allowed per funding level. Because this program is administered over a biennium, we need to review ocean changes made last year for new applicants this year. Professional fees is now a separate activity under public facilities. Communities can separate professional fees from the construction activity budget for projects in which design work needs to commence and be paid for 
prior to the environmental review release of funds for the construction activity. Professional fees are not eligible unless connected to an eligible construction activity. Questions regarding the project's location in relation to a floodplain have been added to the compliance details page. And all activities that comprise a neighborhood revitalization project should be entered as one project with administration and demolition, which qualifies as slum and blight as the exception. The next three slides show screenshots of the changes I just covered. This is an example where there are two separate activities under this critical infrastructure project. One is for the construction activity, flood and drainage. The second is for a professional fee. This way, a community can get its release of funds for the professional fee, go forward with that activity, and draw funds prior to completing the environmental review and contracting out the flood and drainage facilities project. This is a screenshot of the compliance details page in OCEAN that shows the new questions related to the floodplain. And this slide shows an example of how neighborhood revitalization projects should be entered into OCEAN. There will be one project for all activities that qualify under the low and moderate income area benefit national objective. If the community is also doing a slum and blight project, a demolition project, it will be entered separately as a slum and blight project. And then administration is a standalone admin project. Please refer to these screenshots when entering applications, especially if you are applying for neighborhood revitalization. We are still finalizing changes to the application attachments for 2021, but we do not expect to make many changes. Over the past two years, we have updated the CETIS forms to reflect critical infrastructure and downtown as open cycle programs, added a required construction schedule and timeline for the availability of leveraged funds to the readiness to proceed instructions. Communities are required to upload the FEMA flood insurance rate maps for all activities that have a physical location so we can ensure projects are not in the floodway. Policy Notice 1902, our Income Survey Policy Notice, was updated again this past January. Commitment letters for leveraged funds require a signature, a dollar amount, and the year the funds will be available. There is a new reporting form for revolving loan fund. And the neighborhood facilities inventory no longer has to be stamped by an engineer, but still has to be completed and signed by a qualified individual. The administrative capacity form was updated to include experience with administration of other types of grants and is used to demonstrate adequate staffing if a community has multiple requests or multiple open grants. The critical infrastructure condition form was updated to include a narrative on beneficiary impact. And there is a new form for communities that will enter into a subrecipient agreement for public services. Qualifying projects using the American Community Survey data and income surveys continue to be a challenge. The 2011 through 2015 ACS is the current data set used to income qualify projects. The ACS data collection period was from January 1, 2011 to December 31st, 2015. We received the data from HUD on February 19th of 2019 and it became effective April 1st of 2019. The data is available in table and map form on OCD's technical assistance website. The 2019 data altered the eligibility of a number of communities. And policy notice 1902 outlines how to use that data. 1902 did replace 1702. It revised sample size requirements. 
Surveys can no longer include more responses than the valid sample size, and income surveys are prohibited for places and block groups with an American Community Survey data margin of error of, the, of less than 5%. In general, surveys are valid if conducted after January 1st of 2016, which is after the last day of data collection for the 2011-2015 ACS. Margin of error comparisons between the American Community Survey data and an income survey only pertain to entire places. Surveys for partial places or block groups are not subject to the margin of error calculation or comparison. And surveys with responses exceeding the valid sample size can potentially be adjusted to correct the sample size. A new survey is required if the number of responses cannot be adjusted. We can show you how to do this. So if you have a survey with more responses than the sample size, please contact us for assistance. Communities are not permitted to combine a survey and ACS data to qualify a service area. The service area and survey area must be coterminous. In other words, the boundaries of the survey area and the service area much ma must match exactly. You may not select a service area that is a subset of a survey area it's not statistically significant. OCD just received the 2021 Section 8 income limits from HUD. They were posted April 1st. If you started an income survey after April 1 of 2021, you must use the new limits. These are also the limits you must use for home repair projects or for low and moderate income limited clientele projects that require income qualification. Also, please remember, if you do use ACS data from a place or a block group to qualify a smaller service area, which you are permitted to do, OCD can request an income survey if it does not appear the ACS data accurately represents the demographics of your service area. For example, if it appears your project serves the wealthiest street in town, we may ask for an income survey and not accept the ACS data. If you have any concerns about your income survey, please let us review it prior to submitting your application. We can't always review other application documents due to the competitive nature of some of our programs, but we're always happy to look at income surveys. This is an example of what the American Community Survey data looks like. As you can see, it's now published with a margin of error calculation. It's incredibly helpful to look at this number if you are contemplating an income survey. So a few examples of how to interpret this chart. If you look at the city of Findlay, with a margin of error of 2.8%. You can see that one is prohibited from doing an income survey for a project that benefits the entirety of the city of Findlay because that margin of error is less than 5%. But an income survey is okay for a project benefiting a smaller service area inside the city. If you look at Arcadia Village, because the margin of error is 10.4%, you are permitted to do an income survey. But looking at the margin of error in comparison to the LMI percent, you may not want to do an income survey because combining those two numbers together only yields an LMI percent of 4643 However, you would want to consider doing an income survey for Benton Ridge Village because the ACS data shows an LMI percent of 45.83, but if you factor in the margin of error of 13.5, you get 59.93. So chances are pretty good if you do an income survey, it's going to be over 51%. This next 
slide is a screenshot of the updated income survey form that includes the margin of error calculation. This form is also included in policy notice 1902. As I mentioned earlier, prorata is an implement, implementation requirement versus an application requirement. So we feel as community, it's important to make communities aware of this requirement up front. The specifics and a number of examples are included in policy notice 1903. This requirement applies to the critical infrastructure program, the economic development program, the residential public infrastructure program, and some of the targets of opportunity programs. You may review this slide as an example, but again, the easiest way to think about it is that if the project experiences a cost savings, all participating funders share in that savings. Another easy way to remember or understand is that the percent of CDBG used for the project cannot exceed the percent of CDBG approved in the grant agreement. We're getting very close to the end, but I did want to share a few application tips. Projects must qualify under the low and moderate income or Salmon of Light national objectives. There are a bunch of resources on OCD's technical assistance site. And please use staff as a, research, a resource to help vet projects. Leverage funds must be committed at the time of application. Commitment letters must include the dollar amount and be signed. We cannot accept leverage for which the community is in the process of applying. You want to include backup projects on your alternate projects form. This saves time if there's, if for any reason, We have to swap out a project. You don't have to submit the supporting documentation for the backup project, but you should have it ready to send if we ask for it. Maps are important, especially for the neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure grants. The location map must show the narrative, must show the project, and the service area map must delineate a residential area that will be served. The narratives and photos included in your application must support your service area determination. The neighborhood revitalization and critical infrastructure applications require a higher bar than the allocations program. You pick your allocation projects and we approve them if they're eligible and meet a national objective. Whereas we will never have enough funding to award every neighborhood revitalization or critical infrastructure project submitted. So your application needs to be well thought out, connect all of the dots, include third party or supporting documentation, and tell a compelling story. Application resources are available on OCD's technical assistance site. More information about each of the programs is also available in the 2021 draft annual action plan which is available on development's website. We will now open the session to questions using the Q&A box. We also encourage you to contact us at the email addresses provided on this last slide between now and the June 16th application due date for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. With that, I will say thank you and I think Jared is going to read questions from the Q&A box, and I will do my, make my best effort to answer those for you. Correct. Um, hi, everyone. This is Jared Thomas here. Um, so I'm going to read through questions that we've received on the Q&A screen. So if, if you think of a question in the middle of the session, feel free to type it out there, or if after we end the webinar, or you suddenly have a question conveniently after the webinar, feel free to email myself or any of the other program reps that are on the screen right now. <clears throat> the, so Mary, the first question is about 
comments on the consolidated plan, specifically about street reconstruction and versus resurfacing. Um, okay. Has has the Office of Community Development addressed any of those comments on the consolidated plan yet regarding street reconstruction versus resurfacing? Yes. Yeah, so the way the consolidated planning process works is that we post the plan around the first of May. We hold a public hearing, I'm sorry, around the 1st of March, we hold a public hearing mid-March. We accept comments on the plan through the end of March, and then we work internally to respond to those comments. That um, gets posted as part of the executive summary of program changes, and that also gets submitted to HUD when we turn in our plan to them sometime around the middle of May. So we as an office are currently working internally to respond to questions we received and comments we received during that March 1 through March 30th comment period. And those will be made available um, via the content executive summary and then also um, to hide when they review our plan for approval. Okay, and I guess for housekeeping rules, I'm going to leave two or three seconds of dead air space between each question, um, just so we can get a clean break when we write all the answers down. Um, next question, can leverage for the critical infrastructure program include in-kind or force account work? Yes, it can. Um, if it includes force account labor, please make sure that you go through the process prior to submitting the application in which you ensure that force account is eligible for that type of project and that the community's staff has capacity and the technical expertise to perform that kind of work and it's more effective to use force cost effective to use force account labor than it is to competitively bid the project that is all outlined on the force account labor worksheet and that is an application attachment and so yes it is allowed but if you're going to do that make sure you go through that process using that form and submit that to us as part of the application um, in kind is okay as well we have seen a lot of communities use in-kind engineering from the county engineer's office as part of that 10% leverage. All right. The next question is about monitoring. Um, do grantees need to request a monitoring for previous allocation and or downtown revitalization programs? Um, and the question is specifically about uh, project year 2017. No, so the only monitoring visits a community needs to request specifically, and I should say virtual monitoring visits, is if there is a critical infrastructure or a neighborhood revitalization grant where all the work's been done, all the funds have been drawn, and the community needs us to monitor and close that grant in order for them to be eligible to apply for a new project in 2021. We are doing some desktop monitoring remotely, but we have, um, I'd say nine or so 2016 grants that we're working to monitor and a number of 2017s as well. But if it's not a critical infrastructure and it's not a neighborhood revitalization and you don't need it to be monitored in order to apply in 2021, we will contact you to schedule either a desktop or an in-person monitoring when we need to get that closed. Okay. Um, next question is about ocean and entering in projects. So the question is, is general administration and fair housing considered a quote unquote project for the total number of projects allowed for each allocation application? It is not. So you should have an administration project 
that includes an administration activity, a fair housing activity, and maybe a planning activity. And then you will also have one, two, three, four, or five construction projects, depending on what your allocation is and what kind of requests you get from local jurisdictions. I might add that um, general admin and fair housing is called, is in name only a project in Ocean just because that's how you enter it in the application. Um, but it's not a project, I guess I'll say it's a quote unquote project. Um, then yeah, but it does not <laughs> does not count against does not count against any of those caps. Right. Um, the next question is about street resurfacing or reconstruction, and the question is, so mill and fill cannot be done. Correct. Well, I did. So let me let me take that back. So we are posting the guidance document this week. The easiest way for me to explain it is that if you are simply putting asphalt or a layer on top of what is existing, you cannot do that with allocation funds. If you are removing a layer and building it back up, you can. So I would have to, we would have to take a look at your cost estimate and talk to you individually or specifically about that scope of work. But the easiest way to remember it or to look at it is that if you're putting something over on top, it's not eligible. If you're grinding down and you're rebuilding, it is. Okay. Um, I see there are a couple questions about if program staff got an email, which Wes looks like he answered that question. Um, then, okay, so this is about commitment letters and leverage. So how do you show an OWDA, Ohio um, Water, wow, what is, Mary, I'm sorry, what does a D stand for, an OWDA? Is it Water Development Authority? Yeah, the same thing, the development, the D stands for an Ohio Development Services Agency. So yeah, that D. I should, I should know that, sorry. <laughs> Let me try that again. All right, how do you show an OWDA loan being used as gap financing in a commitment letter? So generally, you're going to be able to get something from OWDA saying that your project is eligible or that it's something that they're willing to provide funding for or able to provide funding for. I know in OWDA's world, it's a loan and they like to do as many of those as possible. And so the commitment letters are going to look a little bit different than if you are committing general revenue funds from your county coffers. We also work with OWDA pretty closely and have a pretty good idea as to what kind of projects they're funding or what their list of, of projects is. But get something from OWDA stating at the very least that you're eligible for loan funds, what the timeline looks like, and that the money is available. And then we also, um, behind the scenes, will reach out to OWDA staff. We do this with Ohio Public Works. We do this with EPA. But if we see that kind of letter in an application, we will also make a call to them and say, hey, have you guys heard of this project? Do you know who this community is? Does this, um, does this commitment letter look legit? All right. Um, do we have a question about, is the PowerPoint going to be made available? And that was answered yes. And the presentation will be available with a recording of the webinar and that'll be available on the technical assistance website. Yes. And that, that was, oh, I'm answering the question. Sorry, I'm just supposed to <laughs> close the question. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> okay. Um, and well, scroll too far down. Um, sorry, my trackpad is quite sensitive. Why do you think you're reading these and not me? Okay, uh, PowerPoint's available. Next question, um, I'm reading it first. 
but previous grant years, grantees for this question were able to use community development funds for paving parking lots for fire stations and senior centers. Would this count as resurfacing and not be eligible for project year 2021? No, parking lots are still fine. Our guidance is specific to street improvement projects. So if you are doing work on a parking lot, um, that this new guidance, this new restriction does not apply. Okay. Then next question is also about street resurfacing. So what constitutes sufficient milling to qualify as reconstruction rather than resurfacing? Full depth milling is expensive where edge milling is relatively less expensive. That is true. So my advice would be that if you do have an expensive project, you're probably gonna wanna look at critical infrastructure funds versus using your allocation for that because you can do a whole lot more with a $500,000 critical infrastructure grant where you're actually making significant sustainable street improvements for a relatively significant or impactful number of linear feet. Um, I think what I will do with that question is let's, we're gonna put the guidance document up on the technical web assistance website within a couple of days, please take a look at that as soon as it goes up. And if that does not answer your specific questions, let's have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, it, it's very difficult for us to talk conceptually about what does and what does not qualify just based on a question in a Q&A box. We're gonna to wanna to talk to you specifically about your project. Um, and this is about the neighborhood revitalization program and community participation. Um, the question is, is there still time to do the community participation for a neighborhood revitalization grant? Or is this something that should have already been done? It depends on what you're able to do in the next two months. So we do have communities that apply for neighborhood revitalization grants that start the prior year, start holding public meetings or at least getting the community on notice that they're gonna be applying for this program starting in September or October or November of 2020 for a June 2021 application. However, we've also had communities be successful starting in March or April. There's a process that needs to be followed. I certainly don't wanna discourage you from getting a start on it. I will say this also that um, we have allowed communities to, so say that you do get a start this year and you find that you either don't have enough time to sufficiently go through the process to your satisfaction prior to submitting an application in June or you do submit an application in June and it doesn't rank as high as some of the other ones due to the somewhat late start, that citizen participation process that you're starting now can help build a strong application for either next year, well, I guess since we're not talking about those kind of changes right now, we'll say 2023, um, at the very least, you're getting a good start in 2023, um, but maybe you'll have time to put something together this year as well. We don't want to discourage you from doing it. And, and other communities have done it successfully. Okay. Then... Um, sorry, Diana, you posted an answer, I guess, in the Q and A box. Did you mean for me to ask that to to Mary or or what? Yes, it should have posted as a question, but since I'm the host, it posted as an answer. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry for the confusion there. Um, so the question is about allocation and the number and alternate projects. Um, so for allocation applications, is it always required to have an alternate project. 
And also, if the county has three projects, um, sorry, let's let's answer that first question first, Mary. So, for allocation, is it always required to have an alternate project? I would have to look at the alternate projects form that is part of the application. I believe the answer to that question is no. I believe it's simply recommended that if you're only applying for allocation, you have an alternate project. It's only required if you're applying for critical infrastructure and neighborhood revite, and you're using some of your allocation as matched to one of those more competitive applications, that's when it's required. It's not required for allocation only. However, going back to the discussion about um, communities potentially having a grant reduction if they apply for something that's ineligible or a project that cannot be corrected quickly if there are application deficiencies, I would advise communities to include a backup project on their allocation applications only, just in case we do have a situation where something comes in and it's not eligible or there's an issue with the income survey. That way we can work with you to swap out those projects really quickly and you will get your allocation in its entirety rather than having an application come in, we determine a project is not eligible and you don't have a backup on that form. And now you're scrambling with a pretty tight window of 30 days to be able to get the application back in and um, with a, a new eligible project. And then um, the second part to this person's question, um, so if the so, if, for example, a county is applying for allocation and they have three projects to apply for, but the total sum of those projects doesn't meet that $150,000 maximum that they have, will the county still receive funding? The county will still receive funding. But for example, if your allocation is $150,000 and you are using 20% of that for admin and fair housing. So you've got $130,000 to spend on projects and your three projects add up to $80,000. You'll receive $80,000 and then you can use up to 20% of that for admin and fair housing. You wouldn't receive the entire 150,000, but you would still receive an allocation grant agreement. Okay. And I would say this too, work with us to help identify projects. You know, we've got two months until applications are due, and I know there's a whole lot going on this year, and you're working with your, um, you know, local villages and cities and townships to start to uh, get project submissions and review them locally. But if you have a situation where you're not getting project requests or you're getting requests for small dollar amounts, reach out to us and see if we can brainstorm a little bit with you on something that you may maybe can do um, to submit for the entire allocation rather than reduce requesting a reduced amount. So let us help you brainstorm a little bit before you just say, you know what, I've only got $90,000 worth of projects. That's all I'm going to ask for. Got it. Um, so next question is about conferences and I'm going to, expand on the question a little more just to give background information on what the conference in question was. So the question is, will there be a conference like OCD did in previous years over three or four days ever again? Um, those conferences were always very informative. So that's a good question. We've actually been having some internal conversations about that because it's been a number of years since we have had um, an in-person um, summit, as it used to be called, for those of you who have been around for a while. I cannot answer that question definitively, but if you think it is helpful and it's something that you would like us to consider, please make that request known, and we will we will have a, an internal conversation about training. My guess is that because everyone's doing so many things virtually now, what we would probably end up doing would be creating smaller 
segments where somebody could tune in and listen to something specific on labor standards or something specific on environmental review um, rather than that structure of three or four days straight, whether it's in person or virtually going from, from eight to five. Okay, um, next question was about free applications and where they're located. Um, that question was answered in the Q&A box that they're available right now on the technical assistance website. And um, so that was that question. The, uh, sorry, one second. Another question about eligibility for street reconstruction. So is a street improvement that involves widening a street by adding structure in a paving course eligible? My initial response to that is yes, but I would definitely reach out to talk to us one on one. All right, um, another eligibility question, not for streets. Uh, would a project to clean, repair, and pave walking trails be an eligible project? So we cannot do repair. We can pave walking trails. And I don't really know what cleaning a walking trail would entail. Um, it's always difficult for us to provide eligibility determinations and guidance based on a question, whether it's an email question or whether it's something posted in the Q&A box. So my initial response is there are elements of that project that seem like they would be eligible, but I would want you to provide more detail in an email to staff to let us work through that. I think I'll also mention um, in response to that, I know that the CHIP staff last year working remotely set up something they called office hours that allowed communities to talk through project ideas, work through issues they were having administering their CHIP grants um, because we're not able to do in-person technical assistance meetings right now. And so I would recommend communities that want to talk through eligibility and have specific projects, not only send us an email that has questions, but also arrange a time to do a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting where we can meet with you just like we're at a conference room and talk through some of those eligibility questions one-on-one -on -one, um, for these very specific projects. Okay. Um, next question about critical infrastructure and the EPA requirement we mentioned earlier. Um, is the PTI or permit to install or the plan approval required to be submitted with the letter of interest or is it only required as part of the full application? Only required as part of the full application. So you tell us on the pre-application that you have it, check a box, and then you submit it with the full application. Okay. Um, then next question is, will there be any ocean specific training offered this year? No, but we can do one on one ocean training via screen sharing. That's how we reviewed applications last year. That's how we're pretty much doing everything now. So um, contact us and request a one on one ocean training via Teams, and we would be happy to oblige. Okay. I will say um, this also about ocean. If you're talking about ocean training specific to application entry, that is us. If you're talking about 
submitting status or final performance reports, if you're talking about drawing grant funds, if you're talking about some of those um, either grants operations or compliance functions, let us know specifically what you're looking for. There could potentially be a quick reference guide on our TA site that already walks you through that process, or it could be something where um, either instead of or in addition to us doing an ocean training via some virtual platform that um, Brian Cunningham, who is the grants operation manager, that it might be something that he would want to be or would need to be involved with as well. So when you reach out about ocean training, please let us know specifically what you're looking for. And to the person asking that, that question, I'm going to reiterate what Mary said about um, virtual meetings via Microsoft Teams and screen sharing. So if you have an issue in Ocean and you need some help walking through the application, of, we can help you out in real time as well using Microsoft Teams. So you can share your screen and show us what you're working on in the application in real time. Okay, then a couple comments in the section about eligible activities. Um, so the first one, person saying drug counseling is an eligible activity. However, the clients are not limited clientele. How must the project meet LMI or the LMI requirement? So there are actually three types of limited clientele. There is limited clientele where you have an identified presumed class like senior citizens or severely disabled adults or victims of domestic violence. Then you have a limited clientele where based on the nature and location of the public service, you can presume that at least 51% of the beneficiaries are going to qualify as low and moderate income. Um, an example of that would be a food pantry in a low and moderate income city. So it's locations in a low and moderate income area, and it provides a service, a food pantry, that you would assume that people who LMI qualify would use and people who were not low and moderate income would not use. And then the third type of limited clientele is one where you do have to income qualify recipients. So for most of those like drug abuse counseling and testing or some of the other more interesting ones on those two slides, it's still qualified as limited clientele because it benefits a specific group of people, not a specific residential area, but you would have to income qualify those who are receiving services. Okay, um, next question is about engineering and professional fees. Um, this person saying that, because uh, um, earlier, Mary mentioned breaking out professional fees in the ocean application, breaking that out from construction costs. So if you needed to draw funds to pay for engineering costs before construction started, you could do that. So the question was, if CDBG funds engineering costs, then that would have to be competitively procured. That is very true. All right, the next question is um, about floodplains and floodways. So projects can be in a floodplain, just not a floodway, correct? That is correct. So when we review that, we as in Tim and Cecilia, but when we review that particular tab in Ocean, if your project is in a floodplain, we tag it and we use that as an opportunity to provide technical assistance on the environmental review process to make sure the community knows it's going to have to publish a floodplain notice and go through some additional steps in compiling the environmental review record. If it's in a floodway, we flag it and say, nope, sorry, can't do it. Let's talk to you about your backup project 
Another reason it's a smart idea to have a backup project on your alternate projects form, even if you're just applying for allocation. Okay, then uh, the next question is about service areas and finding your LMI percentage. So can you average block groups that represent a service area to qualify the service area? So that you're taking the total number of LMI households in each block group and dividing them by the total number of households. Okay, can you read that one to me one more time? Right, yeah, I was trying to um, figure out a good way to read it and summarize it to the crowd. So for, for taking multiple block groups and making that a service area, um, how do you find the LMI percentage for more than one block group? Okay, so that actually is in policy notice 1902, but what you would do is you would add up the total populations for say it's three block groups. You would add up the total populations for those three block groups. You would add up the number of LMI persons in each of those three block groups, and you would divide the number of LMI persons total into the number of persons total, and that would give you your LMI percent for your service area. Doing that on the fly with nothing in front of me, staff, please tell me I said that correctly. Yeah, you did say that correctly. So in other words, if you have, for example, one block group that's 40% LMI, and you have another block group that's 80% LMI, you can't just take those two numbers and average them. You have to add up the total number of LMI people in both block groups and divide that by the total number of residents in the block groups. And that's how you find your LMI percentage. And that's something that if the grantee has a question on that, you can email us and we can verify for that for you. That's a, a yes or no question of, is it correct? It's not something that's on an, one of our other forms that's a little more subjective in nature or that has a, a large narrative. This is a yes or no question we can answer before you apply. Um, okay, this is about um, other funding sources. So, is it possible to replace local funds with, sorry, uh, I'm just trying to read over for this. I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I'm just gonna ask it. Is it possible to replace local funds with other grant funds post project award? Um, <laughs> well, of course it's possible. Um, so ideally, no. When you apply to us and you tell us that your request to us is for a $200,000 allocation project and your matching funds is $100,000 from the village of something. That is what your funding package is supposed to look like when you go forward with the project. That said, if we give you a grant agreement in September of 2021, and by some miraculous event, this village happens to apply for grant funds from some other source and get them, and they choose to use the grant funds rather than their local commitment for the project, we're not gonna say, no, you have to use your local funds However, we don't want grantees submitting commitment letters for local funds at the time of application, knowing that the local government doesn't have this money and that they're gonna have to go after a grant in order to be able to do the project. 
that's not being very honest with us up front because we're approving your project thinking all of the funds are committed and in reality they're not so i definitely would not do that the other thing that you cannot do is apply to us or apply to another agency program for those grant funds so for example if you apply to us for the allocation program for those dollars and committed local funds, and then two months later applied to the agency's governor's office of Appalachia for grant funds to replace that local match. We're gonna say, oh no, you're supposed to submit those applications to all development service agency programs at once. You can't come back in and apply for grant funds after the fact for a grant agreement that the agency's already issued. Okay, and then as a reminder for housekeeping, um, please, if you have any questions, um, type them in the, the Q&A section rather than the chat. We're keeping the chat box open for technical issues. Um, so Mary, right now I'm reading through the, the chat section of this. Um, we got we have a couple more questions there. So person says the presentation seemed to indicate that we must have the permit to install or EPA plan approval prior to requesting critical infrastructure funding. I believe this is incorrect is what the person said. You have to tell us at the pre application stage that your project is ready to proceed meaning that you have a PTI or you have plan approval or there is nothing that's going to prohibit you from doing the environmental review and getting the release of funds within three months after the grant agreement is awarded, which is the requirement for critical infrastructure. And then you have to submit evidence of that, either the plan approval or the permit to install with your full application. So again, you tell us in a checkbox on the critical infrastructure pre-app that you have it. And then when you submit the application four weeks later, three weeks later, by June 16th, you include it with that application submission. Okay, and I'm reading, I'm trying to keep track of other questions in both the chat and the Q&A section. Um, I guess a follow up to our last question on engineering and procurement, if you're using CDBG to fund that. So the question is, would engineering services be procured according to a higher revised code? Yes. Okay, and then this person said, um, asked if it was the quality based selection method of procurement per the Ohio revised code. We would have to, I would have to verify that looking at our procurement documents on our technical assistance website. But yes, I believe that is correct. That you would go through an RFQ process for professional services. Right, yeah, the Ohio Revised Code, I mean, we, our guidance documents to also answer the question, um, um, that we call it an RFQ, request for qualifications, and in the Ohio Revised Code, they also call it a qualifications-based selection um, if you go in the, the ORC regs. Um, one second, excuse me, I'm just reading. And then I, I guess there's a follow up on that question and the procurement. So the procurement of the engineering, I'm assuming, has to be performed by the applicant. Correct, <clears throat> yes. Okay. So I, Mary, at this point, I believe we have addressed all the questions 
through the Q&A section and I didn't see anything else in the chat box. Um, oh, one word just came up, thanks. Um, so two parts of this question. First, um, the person's asking just to confirm that critical infrastructure is open cycle and could be applied for next year if not already awarded. Correct. So the way critical infrastructure has worked the last several years and the way we anticipate it working again in 2021 is that the first round of critical infrastructure funding coincides, the application due date coincides with allocation in the neighborhood revitalization program. And then we usually run a second round of critical infrastructure sometime around the first of the year. So if a community is not ready to apply in June, they can submit a pre-app to us at any time to be in consideration for round two with dates to be determined. Or if an applicant applies in round one and isn't funded, we will hold that pre-application open and they can reapply for round two, again, dates to be determined. So um, we anticipate there'll be at least two opportunities for communities to apply for critical infrastructure funds in 2021. And because we administer the allocation on a biennial cycle, we try not to make too many changes between within that cycle. So when we make major changes, we'll make them um, you know, between 2020 and 2021, not between 2021 and 2022. So we would anticipate running critical infrastructure the same way in 2022 as well. So this question is about also about funding availability, but for neighborhood revitalization. So um, all PY 2021 grantees are eligible to apply for neighborhood revitalization. And then this person's asking that we're, or she's saying, is she correct that neighborhood revitalization will not be available again until 2023? And how will that change if and when the allocation program is restructured? Right, so that is correct. As long as we have allocation, the neighborhood revitalization program is going to be tied to allocation in that communities can only apply in the year they receive allocation. If allocation goes away, it is my recommendation that neighborhood revitalization is opened up to all of the eligible, eligible communities every year we have funding but that's an if not a when and we are always open to feedback from our communities about the structure of these programs and so um, maybe a little bit of, of follow-up or background for those of you who did participate in the advisory board meeting for this program last year and a separate smaller stakeholder meeting to talk about um, changes to the program, changes to the program structure, please continue to provide feedback. Don't think that that was your one and only opportunity last year to give us your opinions about these programs. And so I guess I would kind of put that question back in the um, audience's court and say, you know, if we make changes and allocation is no more, or if we make changes and allocation stays, how do you want to see us handle the neighborhood revitalization program? All right, I believe that's the last question that at least I see um, anywhere. So, at this point, um, if anybody doesn't have any more questions, our contact information's on the screen right now. Um, feel free to email. 
and reach out and we'll answer any questions you have after this. Definitely. And one of the things we will do as well is between now and the time the, the Q&A is posted on the technical assistance website, we will go through and reread all of these questions and make sure the answers we have provided are correct. And so you will want to look at that Q&A once it's posted because um, we will be doing some cleaning up and some just making sure that the answers we've given are correct and make sense. And with that, I guess I will say thank you to everybody who participated as well. Please take advantage of the technical assistance we can provide. Um, it's two months, a little less than two months until applications are due, and we expect to use the majority of that time to be answering emails, doing Teams one-on-one -on -one consultations, and phone calls, um, conference calls with you to make sure that 2021 is a super successful community development program year. Okay, thank you everyone. We will post this as soon as it's ready. And if you have any questions, email us. Have a good afternoon.